this is not a time to separate sports and race and politics right now. And some sports shows have been assimilating that very well over the past couple of weeks, especially uh, given the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. One of those shows has been Fox Sports 1, Skip and Shannon Undisputed, uh, with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp talking adroitly and in depth about their experiences with sports and race. And another person who has been very open and very candid in talking about uh, sports and race, uh, given this uh, fraught backdrop fraught with racial tension is our guest on the a lot of sports talk podcast she is the moderator of fox sports one skip and shannon undisputed she is the lead college football reporter for fox sports and the dog mom to the cutest bernese that (laughs) i have ever laid my eyes on jenny taft of fox sports and fox sports one joins us right now first of all jenny thank you so very much for joining us uh merci beaucoup ça va Ça va très bien. Merci. Bonjour. Thank you for having me. I got to show you my guy Otis because he's here. So don't worry. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Uh, I am so sorry that I am taking the attention away uh, from you for Otis. All right. I'm sorry to take uh, your attention away from Otis. uh, He's going to take a long walk after this. So we're good. Oh, no problem. Is that what he's doing right now? It's like, this is my time that I usually walk. looking at me waiting for (laughs) waiting for that walk because we walk to get a coffee. But the the kick is there's treats at the coffee shop. Ah. So it's a good win for both of us. <laughs> ah, perfect. Okay. So we'll try and wrap this uh, interview up as soon as possible so Otis can uh, get his wonderful treat that he deserves, uh, that I am sure. Uh, so, yes, uh, I mentioned at the very top uh, talking about and assimilating sports um, and race and politics. Um during the production meetings and uh, get-togethers that you have had with uh, Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp um, off-camera and other people whom you might have interacted with off-camera who are able to be around you given uh, the uh, uh, given COVID-19, uh, what have you learned uh, from their experiences and their stories uh, that deal with sports and race that you might not have been aware of uh, before uh, their conversations about it, given uh, what has happened the past couple of weeks? Um, well, it's it's a, such a broad answer, right, to something that I think has been really important that Undisputed has been not afraid to shy away from. And that's just the first thing I wanted to point out was um, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, you know, the world was paying attention. And I remember thinking over the weekend and processing, and I grew up in Minneapolis, so it, it was it affected me in a way that I had not been affected before. And I admit that humbly because I feel like that's a blindness to certain things that have been going on, and that I can own. But... Um, Steven Jackson is often a guest on our show as well and Undisputed and he started to post that the two had relationships and I was just so emotional over this and that it it just felt like the sports world needed to take a backseat to the real world, to what's happening in our country and Undisputed never wanted to shy away from it. We were encouraged by it, by our bosses to have these conversations and I you mentioned production meetings. So normally, yes, Skip and Shannon and I would meet in the morning very early. Um, 4 a.m. is our normal meeting time. But we had been at home when that had happened. So we were not doing the traditional meetings. We weren't really even getting on the phone. All of our topics were kind of being sent through emails. And we have different producers who are having conversations with them. But I wanted to make sure I understood where they were coming from before the show. And um, I spoke to both of them and, you know, I think Shannon and I have developed a really great friendship over the last couple of years, but the conversation we had that night was just different. And I felt like I heard him in a different way. And he was talking to me about growing up in rural South Georgia and just that I would never understand what it felt like to grow up there. And it just has been replaying in my head. Every single, it's, and I'm not just saying that, it has really been replaying in my head. And as I've tried to read more and talk more to family and friends, and 
Um, so what was unique was we all of these conversations we were having were not planned out. I mean, of course, the topics were discussed ahead of time, but what I'm hearing from Skip and Shannon, who Skip shared a pretty moving story about being raised by a black woman in Oklahoma, Katie Bell, and it was incredibly moving and powerful. And I didn't know that about Skip. So we're having these emotions that are real on air. And I, I've never done that before. <laughs> and I don't even know you don't even you don't prepare for that you just you look inside and you think i can be better and i have a lot to learn but i also have a lot to process of why things have been not talked about in the past it just i mean almost anger that i felt like why am i 32 years old and i'm just getting this in a way that i hadn't before um and it was it's been a really interesting couple weeks for me in terms of how i can be better and i've been listening to this podcast. Um, I'm sure you've heard of it by now. It's 1619 New York Times. Blown away by just what I didn't know about slavery. I mean, these are things I loved history growing up. And I, I, I'm learning. And that was what Shannon said to me. He's like, you need to learn. And you need to read. And you need to educate yourself. And in six months, when I ask you about it, we're going to have another conversation. And I think that that's what I've been trying to remember and encourage my friends and family to do and I'm having conversations with neighbors about Undisputed. I'm having conversations with our security guards at Fox and you know people are coming up to me and saying I love what you guys are doing because you're starting a dialogue that wasn't there before and you know what it's not perfect and I haven't been perfect in these moments but we're being real and we're trying to at least be honest and that's what I'm hoping comes across in the best way because I'm far from done in terms of learning and growing, but I'm trying and I hope that in an, the next couple months, Shannon and I can sit down and have a conversation and go, wow, I, I, we're seeing a shift and I believe that's happening and I pray that that's happening and it's been a, I hope a, the start of change that has been much needed. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the things that uh, you've been doing to educate yourself more reading and listening uh, to podcasts as well. Uh, what are some of the other uh, either podcasts or books or articles that you've been reading as well as you mentioned you talked about the conversations that you've had with other people outside mm -hmm. of it. Have you met any either resistance um, from people who might still be a little bit sheltered or how have those conversations been like when you've had to uh, engage them in these conversations or have they universally been where you are in terms of trying to be as open as possible to learn? That's a good question as well. And um, one of the books I just ordered is White Fragility, which I've heard really good things about. And um, Shannon was saying, look, you have to read more Martin Luther King. And that is absolutely true. Like I, of course you read stuff in history and you read about different stories, but you don't really sit down and read it. And that's been on my list as well. So I'm just trying to like those two things and then finishing this podcast right now, I was just listening to it on the drive home and it's, it's eye opening. Abraham Lincoln, there's things about him that I didn't realize in terms of how things all happened. And just, I'm, it's, it's, I've said eye opening and that I'm going to keep saying it because that is the truth. Like how were we not able to know these things. Why were history books written the way they were? Why were we not having these conversations? Why were they not supported in classrooms? Like all that has really just been um, sticking out to me. But I think what's so cool is that my parents, they're in Minneapolis and um, my grandma's there and you know, look, we've all, we all grew up there, but I'm having these conversations with my mom and dad who are lovely individuals and you know, we're having conversations on the daily about this, right? So if, if I'm having conversations with my parents and I'm having conversations with my neighbors who, you know, I have neighbors who are 60 and 65, they have a young daughter in college and we're having these conversations that might not be perfectly aligned, but we're talking about it in a way that's different. I think that that's part of the change. And I'm talking to my grandma who's 90 and she has stories about what she has seen and, experienced and I hope to think that that is going to be the start of something and I mentioned it on Undisputed yesterday how Kyla Murray put out a statement about kneeling and Patrick Mahomes said I need to be able to use my platform in a new way and for whatever reason 
we hadn't always seen those younger athletes being comfortable with a voice. Frankly, I don't know if I have ever felt comfortable with a voice. Maybe I still don't, but you were, we're seeing this younger generation and social media can be a good and a bad thing, right? But if yes. we use it for the good, and if we're seeing these young athletes impact the younger generation, that to me is going to be all about changing what is happening at home. And I don't have kids right now, but you know, one day, of course, that's what something I'd like to do, my husband and I. But you know, it it starts with what you do at home and your heart. And I think that I'm just happy we're able to talk about it. Would we have been talking about this a couple months ago had we not done this podcast? I mean. It, Things are different now, and there's no shying away from it. I, I'm sick of people saying, oh, that's uncomfortable, because the truth is it should be uncomfortable, and that's where I'm at right now. Uh, once again, Jenny Tav joining us on the A Lot of Sports Talk podcast as well as our uh, live stream on Facebook. Uh, you mentioned your upbringing uh, in uh, Minneapolis or just south of Minneapolis in uh, yeah. Edina, Minnesota. Um, did you ever feel, and you alluded to this a little bit, um, uh, how, describe your upbringing, and did you ever get the sense that there was this kind of simmering uh, tension in the underbelly of the Minneapolis area that enough people in the area have said that that's been around uh, in the Minneapolis area for around? Like, did you feel that there were just two different uh, Minneapolises uh, in terms of your upbringing and what you're uh, knowing now? I would be lying to you if I said I felt it. Um, and I think that's more just maybe being naive to the situation and not that I shouldn't have felt it, but you know, I grew up in, in, in Edina, which is very close to Minneapolis. And I, of course, was downtown plenty, but I also left, went to college in Boston when I was 18. So when I was young, maybe I wasn't thinking about it in the same way. And then when I went back, I by no means was thinking about it. But over the last couple of years, there's just been a lot of red flags in Minneapolis and some horrible incidents. And I think that's what's been alarming to see Minneapolis on the map in a way. I mean, I'm so proud of where I grew up and the people there and the community. And it's it's so disheartening. And I, I think I said this to Steven Jackson. I'm like, I'm embarrassed that like this is where I'm from and this is what had happened there. And he was like, look, the people of Minneapolis are coming together. And he, he had been on the ground there for weeks and we talked a little bit just about what he'd seen and um, I think seeing my friends attend peaceful protests and a lot of my friends and family who are still in Minneapolis and seeing that their eyes had been open in a new way that was very cool to see from the outside and I haven't been back in a while now my parents are there and um, I miss them you know hopefully I'll get to go back soon but um, I, I think you're seeing how badly things need to be different. Yeah. Uh, apologies for the inelegant segue uh, that I'm going <laughs> to make, uh, but thank you so very much for sharing uh, those personal experiences and your experiences talking with Skip and Shannon and many other people uh, in terms of the enlightenment uh, that you are continuing uh, to undergo uh, about uh, these issues. And I can't thank you enough for sharing that uh, information and those uh, stories with me. Um, we're going to talk about uh, your time at Fox sports one and you are an og uh you joined uh in 2013 when uh fox sports one launched uh so take me through uh the audition if you had an audition um you were working uh at fox sports north uh at the time before your time at uh, fox sports one and uh take me through that audition especially knowing that this was an audition uh that could end up and eventually did end up with you being the being part of the first staff uh, at a network uh, that was going to make a whole lot of noise and compete with many of the other 24 uh, seven sports networks. So uh, take me through that uh, audition. Any nerves? Um, yeah, take me through all of that. Uh, the OG uh, will take over. The OG. I like that. I'm going to stick with that. Uh, it's a good story, actually. It's a fun story. Oh because I had been at, at Fox Sports North in Minneapolis, like you mentioned, but I was really only working part-time there, and I had interned in college, so they they 
knew me. They knew my potential. I think they believed in me there, which was so special because I have so many colleagues at North that I still keep in touch with that helped me tremendously. But um, I had really loved being at Fox, and Fox Sports North was obviously the place that got me started. And um, unfortunately, in, in those local regional markets, there's not always jobs that come up so often. So I was working part time. I was nannying. I was working at a yoga studio. You know, I was really looking for a full time on air gig. And I had an opportunity in Boston. I graduated from Boston University, so I had um, a couple connections at Nesson, and I had an opportunity to go work as the Bruins ringside reporter. And I have a hockey background. I played my whole life. My dad was a professional hockey player. Um, my husband just retired. My brother played. My mom's a speed skater, like hockey's in my blood, right? So I, for whatever reason, and I, I'm big on following gut and instinct, it felt like I shouldn't go cover hockey. It just, it didn't feel like the right move to make that was going to push me in a different way. And if FS1 would not have been an option, I probably would have ended up there, and I hope it would have been amazing, and still things would be the way they are. I mean, I'm sure I would have absolutely loved it, because I love hockey, and Boston sports, it was great. I mean, I, I experienced it at college. So the story is, I told my bosses, I had this opportunity in Boston, and I said, I, but I don't necessarily want to take it. If there's any opportunity within Fox, you know, I'm in to stay a part of this. And they said, well, you know, FS1 is launching. I know they've made a lot of hires, but let's see if we can get you out for an audition. They had kind of realized they might need a few more on-air talent. So I was kind of, I think I interviewed, it was either late July or mid-August, because I think my first day on air was late September. So it was a pretty quick turnaround. So they were just kind of try, realizing they needed more people. So I went into audition for the newsroom reporter. So it was a desk reporter job where we'd come in, and I don't know if you remember this, at the beginning of FS1 it would be, hi, here are three things you need to know. So I three, know that. Yes. thank you. I'm glad you were watching. <laughs> stories that you need to know. And I remember flying in, I figured I've got nothing to lose. It's California. I mean, this is paradise. So why not go? And who knows what'll happen? I went into the audition. It was quick. Um, Jacob Ullman, who is a close friend of mine, and he, you know, is at Fox and very in charge of the talent and the hiring. He sat me down. There was not a lot of direction either. It was like, all right, there's a proctor, you know, read read the script. And um, I, it was, I don't, I wish I could, one, find this tape, and two, remember what on earth I was talking about because I have. I think I blacked out in that sense. I have no idea what was said. Um, You're one of the rare people who wants to find their resume tape. <laughs> I know I, I don't. I do. I want it. My voice was for sure a little higher pitched, like the nerves, like, hi, I'm Jenny. You know, there was definitely some of that. But I, the audition was pretty quick, maybe like 20 minutes of what I was doing. And then at the end of it, Jacob was like, all right, we got to go. I'm like, all right, well, can you just give me one second? And he, loves this story because I guess it just took him by surprise so much but I said well hold on one second and I said can I go into the back and introduce myself to everyone who was on the crew and just say thanks and he was like sure yeah you can do that and he was like I've n I hadn't really had anyone do that before and so I went around the room and I said hi and because I knew that their like lunch had been pushed a little bit they were helping me do this audition and I just said like hi I'm Jenny I hope to work with you guys like thank you I mean it was not anything special um, and Jacob always tells me he's like no one no one had really ever done that in that way like it just it it stood out to him and I think it was a, hopefully a good sign and it was potential and they saw potential in me and I went back to the airport I thought that was fun, who knows, and I landed back in Minnesota and I had a call saying like, hey, let, we want to hire you. We don't know what we're going to do with you, but let's let's get you out to LA, we'll put you on the desk, and you know, I think I did a lot of 6 a.m. shifts at the time, which is ironic now because I thought that was horrible, and I wake up at 3 for Undisputed, <laughs> and uh, it has been the best couple years of my life. I have grown, I can't even, I don't even recognize that person in Minnesota in terms of who I was on air. It was just, it has been so nice to be challenged in a way. And I love the Fox Sports 1 family. I love all the events I've been able to cover. I mean, I, I'm, I have to pinch myself 
I'm pretty lucky. So it's it's been a cool journey. Uh, people still don't realize how far please and thank you can take you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, still, <laughs> okay. Just to hear that when you went to kind of the truck or the people in the production and just said, hey, yeah. I just want to thank you. Um, I think the one thing uh, that's going to resonate with a lot of people watching this or not resonate with a lot of people watching this is while you were on camera, Fox Sports North, you're covering some prof you're covering professional teams uh, in a sports mad city in Minneapolis. All right, you're working, you're nannying, you're working <laughs> at a yoga studio uh, as well. Uh, so right at that time, as you are putting on five different hats, while people think that you've had it, you got it made uh, on camera. <laughs> uh, just what were those? days and months and years like when you're just doing this hustle and again a lot of people myself can, included um who has to tutor a student after this interview okay um <laughs> all right what were those kind of days and months like when you're in front of the camera you want to ascend uh to a different position a more marquee position uh but you have to go to the yoga studio and teach and you have to uh, <laughs> nanny as well I, well, I think it's all part of the journey, right? And yes. I can look at it now and think, wow, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. But the grind is so much about how you get to this place, right? And, you know, I did have a lot of jobs in Minnesota, and I offered to volunteer and help with as many things at Fox Sports North that I could get my hands on. I mean, I would just go shadow on-air talent at Fox Sports North Marnie Gellner is a woman who's still there who I really respect and admire and she covers the twins and um, she does a lot of Lynx basketball and she let me shadow her. She'd be like, bring me a coffee, come hang out, we, you can learn and just try to learn as much as you can and just, you know, yeah, I look back and I'm like, yeah, I had a lot of odd jobs and but being a nanny on the side was one of the most fulfilling jobs that I've had, right? So I think it was part of the hustle and maybe I had more energy for it at the time. But then again, you know, I'm still busy now. There's no end point in sight in terms of what you want to do. But my advice is always to individuals, take the job, get in the door. I know people say, well, if you don't want to be on air, like I, I actually think get in the door, prove people, you know, how good you are and that you're easy to work with and be around and cover a sport that might not be comfortable. I mean, I covered Monster Energy Supercross at Fox for five years and it was the best experience. It was the hardest experience. And I had a moment before I went on air for the first time covering motorcycle racing. And I'm like, this is either gonna make or break me because either I can figure this out and immerse myself in this sport and do a good job or maybe TV's not for me. Because if you can't push yourself to do something different, then are we reporters, are we journalists? And it, covering Supercross was the coolest thing for me and I grew so much from it. So I think you just gotta make connections along the way, get to know people, work hard, be nice to people. And you know, it's, it's gonna even out, like those opportunities are gonna come up from taking those up, from taking those chances. And I, I'm so glad I've covered so many things because it's made me so much better now. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you were able to cover uh, was the FIFA World Cup in <laughs> 2018 in Russia, uh, the World Cup that France uh, won uh, in 2018. And uh, of course, it was unfortunate for a lot of fans of the red, white and blue that uh, the United States national team uh, uh, did not was not able to make it fell at the last uh, game of qualifying in the hex. I know you would have probably been. You know, <laughs> providing so many stories to so many people about the uh, United States men's national team. I know that was an opportunity that you would have loved to do if the U.S. was there. Uh, but you got a lot of things done uh, at the World Cup. You were with the French team uh, for a good amount of time. And uh, there's a reason why I did say hello to you in French at the very beginning. Um, <laughs> and a reason why you were uh, embedded with the French team uh, as well. So uh, first and foremost, with the World Cup in Russia, had you had you ever been uh, to Russia before? And what was that experience like just taking in all the different uh, parts of the country? Well, good question. And I had been to Russia before, which okay. is a side story. But the uh, which we'll get the, to eventually. 
we'll get to well, the, you know, the U.S. So that was my role going into it. I was going to be embedded with the men's national team, the U.S. men's national team, once the, when they got to the World Cup. Obviously, that did not happen, and that was a sad day. Let me tell you, it was not a happy day at Fox Sports. I mean, it's just it, it was hard, and I think Fox Sports had been so excited about the World Cup and the women. We're coming off the Women's World Cup, which had been just a tremendous success in 2015 in Canada, which I was a part of with the women. So it was just. I'd say top five coolest experiences I've ever been is covering that women's team. So I was really looking forward to being around the men. I'd been with the U.S. team for the last couple of months getting to know them. So, yeah, of course, it's devastating that they don't qualify. And I had real nerves going to Russia, but they were more nerves of I don't know what my role is going to be because they said we're just going to send you to basically the top match. And there were a lot of flights in the middle of the night through Russia. Three out of four days, I slept on a plane. Because Russia's weird. Russia's the most unique place in the world because they just think, why not? You should fly at night, right? Like, that's just how it should be. So we would take these odd flights from Nizhny Novgorod, Nizhny Novgorod to Sochi, but you don't fly direct because it's Russia. So you have to go through Moscow and then to Sochi. So you'd fly... We'd leave at 2 a.m. and we'd arrive at 6 a.m. There'd be a match day. It was just madness in terms of really how it was at the beginning, the group stage, and it was it was pretty wild. But as France continued to progress and do well, I reminded my bosses and continued to remind the French press officer. I'm like, I speak French. I'm able to you know do these interviews, and I had not really used it a ton um, in the past. I mean, odd jobs, right? I mean, it occasionally came up, like there was a French motorcycle, motorcycle rider that I would speak with and do random fun interviews, but not like going to interview Kylian Mbappe at the World Cup. I mean, it wasn't just anything I'd done before. And um, I kind of earned the team's trust, the Fox's trust that I could actually do interviews in French. And it was hard. There were real nerves. And I'll never forget, as I'm getting to know the French team um, well, and they're seeing my face a little bit more, because it's hard when they've never seen me before. I'm a random U.S. reporter. There's so many reporters covering the Men's World Cup, and it's such an incredible experience to be at. But I was starting to be around more, and I remember um, asking for Antoine Griezmann after one of the matches, and Every player that is listed for media availability, they list whether they can do it in English or French. And I said, you know, would you like to do this in English or French? And he looked at me with this kind of smirk, like, let's do French. You know, like, let's see what you got here. Oh, he here. doubted and you. Yeah. <laughs> it went well, all was good. And I was then, you know, doing more interviews the next, the next match. So I knew that it was kind of like, all right, she can do this. Um, and... I'm just so glad and grateful that I was able to experience it in that sense. And the side note was, yes, I've been to Russia many times because my husband um, played professional hockey over there for a couple years. So I have been, he lived in Moscow. I've been to Moscow probably 12 times, but very for very quick trips just to see him. And, you know, R Russia for the World Cup was about 50 days, and I'm seeing all of Russia. So that was just a unique experience in and of itself and I think I'm good on Russia I'm gonna check it off the list I've mm -hmm. been there done that it's it's very it's cool to see the Red Square you know it's a historical but I'm not probably not gonna go back okay. I'm good oh, fair enough you've had your fill of Russia that <laughs> is totally fine um again Jenny Taft the Fox Sports 1 and Fox Sports joining us uh if People do not catch you uh, covering sports that are stick and ball sports. People will or more than likely will remember you as one of the reporters for the Westminster Kennel Club dog show that occurs in February uh, in New York City. And I'm sure there are many, many viewers uh, who have tuned in and watched that because of their affinity and love for dogs. Um, I mentioned that you have your Bernese Otis um, uh, with you right now. Um, you publicly revealed just a few days back that um, you had not always been so fond uh, of dogs and that um, you were 
attacked by a dog uh, when you were uh, much younger. Um, and again, I, I just hope not to bring up too much trauma. You did mention it publicly, so I just wanted to um, confirm that with you. Um, yeah. How did it get to the point where you might have been not fond or possibly afraid of dogs to the point where uh, you have Otis on your lap right now and putting up pictures of him um, <laughs> and getting to the point where um, you have embraced uh, covering the dog show with being around hundreds, if not thousands of dogs. So uh, take me through that journey uh, from uh, not being too much of a dog aficionado onato, and maybe being scarred by dogs mm -hmm. to now being around thousands of dogs every February. I appreciate you do your research. This is good. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I did post that the other day and uh, it's funny because I, I hadn't really ever posted about that before and my close friends and family know what happened to me but I was a young girl and I was attacked by a dog um, walking home with friends and it was I almost died. I mean, it was really, I was saved. Someone, a neighbor saved my life who was homesick. And one of those crazy situations where he had never stayed homesick before in his life. And it just so happened that he felt like he had to be home that day. And we're still close to this day, but um, it was an Akita. And unfortunately, you know, the family, I don't think treated the dog very well. And that's the, what's so sad about animals, right? Like, I don't know if I believe animals are bad. I think that maybe the dog wasn't behaving and he was outside a lot and he just kind of, the way they explained it, they think the dog just went crazy and I was just walking home and he broke out of the fence um, and I was there. So it was just the timing of it was all pretty crazy and it was pretty traumatic for me for, for a while. I mean, I still have scars on, all over my body. That, I mean, they've healed so well, but like my arm, my shoulder still messed up. Luckily, like he never got my face um, but it was really scary and I'm, you know, 50 pounds and this dog is a hundred pounds and, um, it was a lot, but of course I ended up fine and I, you know, I healed from it, but I was always afraid of dogs. And to the point where my parents, I really wanted to horseback ride as a young kid. And they're like, if you're, if you really want to ride horses, great. Like that's, if you can't be around dogs, like let's do horses. So my parents ended up getting a dog when I went to college, because I was never really that comfortable with the idea, and, mm -hmm. and he was great, and you know, he was a really sweet, he was actually a Bernice mm -hmm. um, as well, and he was really sweet, but I was never that comfortable with him, and um, my husband grew up with dogs, and we'd always kind of mentioned it, and even what's so crazy is this quarantine time, like I feel like having this dog, Otis, that is my like best friend who's sitting right here staring at me. A bur he's a Bernadoodle, so he's half Bernese, half Poodle, so he doesn't shed, which is really nice. And uh, just having this time to bond, I, it has changed me. And it's so crazy the amount of kind of fear I had. Even just being alone with him, there were situations where I just would at times be like, okay, am I doing this right? Because I didn't know if I was doing anything wrong. And the dog show helped so much because when Fox asked me to do it, I had really come so far at that point. I'm like, yes, I would love to be around the dogs. And one of the women who works with Westminster, this amazing lady, Norma, I said to her, I'm like, Norma, it's really important for me if I can meet the Akita. Like it, I told her the story and she was like, absolutely, let's make it happen. So I, the first time I hosted was four years back and we went to the Akita. I met with the Akita, I took a picture and it was just like a full circle moment for me. So. I'm just happy that I've kind of come around to it because I didn't know at the time and you know it was traumatic and I'm so grateful that my friend Jeff saved my life and was homesick that day and you know my friends had, who were walking with me they had called 911 so hopefully someone would have gotten to me in time but look I'm it all worked out I'm so happy I've got this guy Otis and uh yeah I'm it all worked out uh uh Let's all thank Jeff um, and the people around you um, uh, for Jeff being at home at the time that he might not have been. Um, that's story. Yeah, you you knew you. I did post that, and I posted it so like little in one of my comments. Like I've come a long way from when I was scared of dogs growing up. So I appreciate you asking. That's 
really nice. No, no problem. Um, as someone who has come around uh, to appreciating dogs and being in a family that uh, my parents didn't like anything that moved that wasn't a human or a car. Um, if it moved and it wasn't a human or a car, they did not appreciate it, wanted it away from them. And I kind of picked that up from them. And it took uh, a while. Um, it actually took um, uh, being a psychology major and understanding the psychology of humans and how dogs can read it and how it's kind of our uh, body language and behavior and tone that really kind of sets the tone uh, for the dog. So that took me a while. But um, I understand it. I get it. I love dogs. I don't have a dog uh, uh, with me um, as a pet. If I did, probably a boxer. Because um, I'm, yeah, because, you know, we kind of have the same person that me and the, a boxer have the same personality, just goofy and all over the place. They always and, do well at the dog show. Uh, so you know. But they always do well at the dog show. Yes. So they're, yes. So it comes in handy uh, being a boxer. Um, when did you get Otis, by the way? Uh, he just turned one. Yeah, so he's just he's just one. Um, we had a great little celebration where we gave him some steak. So yeah. life is good for Otis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, life is very, very good if you have steak. Um, you mentioned uh, quarantine and being uh, uh, under quarantine given COVID-19 and how yourself and Otis um, and your husband, Matt, you know, able to really, really bond. Um, has... Uh, the coronavirus and its uh, effects um, to the lives of millions. Um, how does has that changed your perspective on sports reporting? Um, and if so, how? I know there's a lot that is to be determined in the next few weeks and months and years. We don't know how sports reporting at live events is going to be um, in the uh, next few weeks and months. Um, but do you feel yourself possibly um, having either a perspective, a new perspective possibly on the way you report sports given the disruption that has occurred uh, in America and across the world the past couple of months? Sure. You know, I have a lot of questions about how sports will be affected by by COVID, and unfortunately, and I know we don't, and we really don't know the answers. Um, you know, undisputed, we've been talking daily about the NBA and um, their plan for this bubble in Orlando, and then you see reports that cases are up in Florida, and it's it's a it's a bummer, and I that's not the right word because we're talking about life and death here. But you know, we all love sports so much. I mean, it's why we're in this, right? I mean, it's what my passion is. It's my favorite thing in the world to watch live events and watch athletes. And I love working as a sideline reporter. I mean, selfishly, my favorite feeling is being on the field and just listening to the crowd. And I love interviewing players. I love interviewing coaches after games. I mean, I get the same adrenaline doing that from when I played sports. So the idea of not maybe being able to do that is for sure something that I've thought about. And I'm hopeful that we will be, you know, in a better situation in the fall where football can continue. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answers to that. I check, you know, you check social media, you watch the news as much as you can. And unfortunately I just hope that people are making the smart decisions for these athletes and players and college students and college athletes. Um, and if I have to stand extra far away with my microphone and, that's fine. I'll do that. I, I just hope that we're able to have a presence because I think we as a country could really, really benefit from some live sports again. But of course, everyone's health is the priority. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Born and raised in Minnesota, you've had some very interesting uh, winters, uh, let's just say. <laughs> and now you've spent uh, the past, you know, close to a decade um, now uh, in Los Angeles. So probably the most important question, and I'll get you out with this. Minnesota or Los Angeles? Pros oh. and cons, what do you pick? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe you just said a decade in Los Angeles. I am I sorry. It flies <laughs> by. It just flies by. Um, I. It's so funny when I think about living in Minnesota because I still, if you said to me, like, FS1 is going to relocate to Minnesota, I'd be like, great, can't wait, love it. Because I love, There, there is a really kind culture in Minnesota overall. Um, 
and I just I like the people there right I have a lot of friends and family and the whole Minnesota nice thing like I always laugh when you go get a coffee and they ask how your day is like they genuinely want to know they're not just they're like how how is your day and then you explain and then you have a little conversation with the barista because it's a process like everything in Minnesota it just has that pace and I like it there I like that I loved growing up there I loved playing sports there I went to a public school and you know, because schools are great, and why in LA, you know, there's private schools everywhere, and it's just a totally different culture here. Um, and you know, we would vacation to the beach maybe every couple of years growing up in Minnesota, and the fact that I'm right at the beach is just it's crazy to me. So I can't pick Minnesota over California. That's just wouldn't be possible. But the people of Minnesota, I would pick over California, although. I found some really good friends here. My husband and I love it. There's a great community in our town, and ironically, a couple of our neighbors are from Minnesota, so we might be onto something there. But uh, you know, it's they're both so different, and the winters are really cold. So I think my blood is thin. I went back and I worked Hockey Day Minnesota this year for Fox Sports North. It was I think like 10 degrees. It was miserable. So I don't know if I would even cut it anymore. We'll see. <laughs> People of Minnesota, but exchange the snow for the sand. Yeah. Okay, so fair enough. And a few people in Los Angeles as well, because you've met uh, a few people uh, who have been wonderful uh, in Los Angeles. Speaking of wonderful people currently in Los Angeles, uh, Jenny Taft, uh, Fox <laughs> Sports and Fox Sports One. I cannot thank you enough for joining us and being part of our uh, podcast yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Best of luck and success with your career going forward. Again, catch uh, Undisputed FS1, Skip and Shannon, Undisputed on Fox Sports 1 in the mornings. Uh, Jenny Taft is the moderator and co-host of uh, Undisputed. And you can catch her when sports comes back oh. on the sidelines <laughs> uh, uh, for college football, working with Gus Johnson and Joel Clad on the number one college football team on broadcast team for Fox Sports. Jenny, thank, thank you. you so very much for joining us, and I hope we get a chance to do this again soon. I have a plan. How about I get you to the dog show next year? Uh, don't tease me like that. I'll let, Let's make it happen. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm there. <laughs> February, next February, we'll talk. I'll be right. there now. Um, I might. It's, it's an experience unlike anything. It's amazing. It's so fun to see. I thought that was the Masters. Okay, but an experience. Yeah. Yeah. All right, fair I enough. That. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay, Jenny, thank you so very much. And again, we'll catch up soon. Good to chat. Thanks for having me. Yeah.